Good morning. I hope everyone can see and hear us well. I am Nikenge Harmon Johnson. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Urban League of Portland. We are a 75 year old social justice and civil rights organization uh, based in Portland, but our advocacy serves throughout the state of Oregon and Southwest Washington. I'm delighted to be here today with uh, my Congressman forever, uh, Earl Blumenauer, and uh, the Urban League State Senator, Senator Lou Frederick. I thank you both for inviting me to, uh, to moderate this conversation with you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm not gonna talk a whole lot at this part. I'll have my chance to do that, but I want folks who are watching to know that this is not a scripted conversation. Uh, we're gonna have a chat about uh, a number of things. I'm gonna get to ask some questions. I'm actually gonna try to peek over on my Twitter feed. Uh, if you have questions you'd like me to ask, you're more than welcome to post something there. I am at True Nikenge, that's T-R-U-E-N-K-E-N-G-E. -E. Again, T-R-U-E-N-K-E-N-G-E. -E. Post there if you've got a question that you really wanna make sure I ask the Congressman or the Senator, and I will try to pay attention over there so I can get your questions in uh, as well as my own. Uh, with that, I would like to um, allow, let's see, who's going first? Uh, Senator Frederick, uh, you have the honor of uh, giving your opening statement first. Oh, and before you do, just so people who are watching know, uh, the Senator is going to give an opening statement, uh, and then we're going to have an opening statement from the Congressman uh, as well, and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into our conversation. All right? Great. Awesome. Thank you. Senator well, Frederick. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, uh, Congressman, for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, it's good to see you again in King Gay. I think we see each other at least once a day over the last few, <laughs> years, the last few days uh, in, in this same sort of format. Uh, I guess I wanted to say two things. We have to deal with both a, uh, some immediate and uh, issues uh, and, and bills that we need to be working with. And we also need to look at a much more long-term situation. So let me talk with about some of the immediate situations. We have a probably we have a special session coming up. We don't have the exact date on that, by the way, in Kenge yet, but we will be having a special session coming up sometime before the end of this month, very likely. Uh, I will, we will be uh, submitting a number of bills. I'm not alone. That's a good thing. I have a, a group of the, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be part of a group that's called the People of Color Caucus, and we will be submitting a number of bills uh, there, there, there are nine of us, and they are terrific. All, all colleagues that are terrific. I have to, I, I, I get a little choked up because when I first joined the legislature, there was just one African American in the House and one African American in the Senate, and now there are nine people of color in the in the in the Senate and the House, uh, and that's just there are two of us in the Senate and and uh, seven seven folks in the in the House, and we'll probably have more. Uh, coming up at the at, by November, so I'm really pleased. We'll be submitting bills, though, um, and one bill is something that has already gone through that deals with um, arbitration and arbitrators uh, and, and limiting what an arbitrator can do and, and not allowing them to dismiss or go outside a discipline matrix. I can get more detailed about that if you'd like, but the idea is that what we're going to be say, saying is uh, we're going to try to find some way of bringing some accountability for um, for actions that police uh, take uh, in this in these in these situations, and up, up until now, that's not been true. We've seen forty plus years of folks saying we're going to be policing ourselves. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of these things, and they have not done that. Uh, so we're going to be talking about how we, in fact, make sure that we have a uh, a system, a, di a clear discipline system that takes place. We are also talking about how we deal with uh, use of force and how that's defined and who investigates it. Uh, those are the, that, that, that's an issue that we'll be dealing with as well. So we have a number of, uh, and, and we have a number of bills. I have a number of bills that I'm, I'm gonna be in introducing. Other folks also have bills that relate to um, the, the carotid artery holds, the, the um, doing things in terms of, of stopping people from breathing. Um, making sure that that's outlawed. Uh, those kinds of, of things are also taking place. We've got a long list of items that we will be presenting before the legislature. Some of them will get done in the special session. Some of them will get done, uh, some, some of them may actually be done before the next session because we may have another special session. People are talking about that as an idea as well. But we will definitely be having a list of things that we wanna see take place uh, in the legislature and, and deal with bills that will work. 
But the other side of that is, frankly, we need to be looking at a complete change in attitude. We need to be looking at a cultural change. Um, Tom Potter, the former police chief and mayor of Portland, uh, just came up with an interesting semantic change that really seems to resonate with an, an awful lot of folks. He suggested that we no longer talk about law enforcement, but that instead we talk about peace officers. And, uh, he, and that's, that particular change was an interesting one. Uh, for another friend of mine, Al Jubitz, uh, was telling me the other day that he was in Ashland recently and a bumper sticker on the police cars in Ashland now says police officer, I mean, peace officer, peace officer. And when he asked one of the, one of the officers what she thought of that, did it change the way people uh, viewed her? She said, it doesn't change the way people view her, but it changed the way she views other people. Um, that's, a, that's an attitude change that we need to be looking at. We need to be looking at things regarding militarization, not just selling, not making sure that we're not selling bazookas and armored personnel carriers to little towns in Eastern Oregon and Southern Oregon, but also taking a quick look at why we seem to have um, this idea that intimidation is the only thing that, um, that public safety is about. So we have officers dressed in, um, in, in gear that's ready for uh, Fallujah. Um, you know, we, we have the, the, they believe that somehow they're get going to war, that they are taking on an, occup they're an occupying force coming in. We have to change that particular attitude as well. I'll talk, we'll probably talk about some of these things in the, in, uh, as well in the future, but those are the two approaches that I'm looking at. Some very specific things that deal with what's going on right now and, and changes, and then some much more long-term issues because everyone has had enough. We are no longer going to allow this to continue and we're going to be taking some action. I plan on taking some action and I know that uh, the Congressman and, and I know in Kinge is already set to go because she wants to get some things done as well. So we're gonna get some things done and we're not gonna be quiet or silent about it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Frederick. Uh, Senator and uh, Congressman Blumenauer, I, I didn't introduce you and sometimes I fail to do that because I've known you for so long and I figure uh, just about everybody knows you. But um, as you give your, your brief statement, will you tell folks a little bit about how long you've been in office in Portland uh, and the roles that you've served, just so people can yeah. um, can really feel where, where you are. Uh, well, thank you, Nikenge. I, I appreciate that. And uh, it is it is an honor for me to, to share this platform with you both. Uh, I, we have known each other a long time, Nikenge. I was uh, uh, impressed with uh, your prowess and determination as a young student athlete on the soccer field. <laughs> And I've watched in your various roles um, in government at all levels um, and have appreciated um, our friendship and our interaction. I, uh, and particularly now your leadership with uh, the premier uh, uh, advocacy group for civil rights. You mentioned the 75 years that the Urban League has had. It's a uh, uh, fighting uh, on the front lines, um, dealing with housing discrimination uh, before uh, all of a sudden people understood what was going on. And your particular role is one that, that I have appreciated. And uh, Senator Frederick, um, I feel like likewise. I mean, I, uh, I remember watching you on Channel 8 uh, uh, with your uh, features um, as a reporter, uh, being a spokesperson for the Portland School District, um, but I guess most important, uh, you have been on this path of education, racial justice. Um, people don't know. I mean, uh, one of my earliest and most profound memories is Lou inviting me to meet with fifth graders from Irvington grade school, that he would bring them in every week to expose them uh, to other people in the community, uh, uh, having and having a black judge be there interacting with them, uh, and you did it uh, year after year. And uh, more recently, in your backyard with black professional young men uh, that you convened, um, and I just uh, I have appreciated how you've done that out of the spotlight. Nobody knew about it. You didn't get any grants. 
I mean, you, you did this uh, out of a spirit of generosity and commitment. And the two of you, I think, are the best possible people to have this conversation. And I am looking forward, frankly, to a conversation. I welcome uh, some of the voices that we might hear, um, as well as questions that uh, they might want us to deal with. Uh, we're in the process right now of finishing uh, a pretty detailed response that is our federal agenda in terms of what we should do to meet the challenges uh, that have so convulsed our nation um, and trying to deal with the, the arsonist in chief uh, who sought to divide us rather than bring us together. Uh, but I'm, I waited, frankly, uh, to finalize it till we had these conversations. Uh, and af, as we finish it this weekend, uh, we will go ahead and finalize that, make it available uh, on uh, uh, the Blumenauer.gov uh, website. Uh, we may even email it out, but we want to do it after we've had a chance to have this conversation because every day I'm learning something else. See, every day I'm being challenged to think of things differently. Um, and I uh, deeply appreciate the dynamic and we will follow through with that uh, this week, uh, reflecting uh, what we're taking back uh, to Congress uh, with my colleagues uh, to deal with these issues. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, we're gonna jump into it. Uh, folks who are watching uh, on YouTube know that we have uh, a little under an hour now uh, for this conversation. I'm gonna get to as many questions as possible. Some questions were previously submitted uh, and I have a list of those there as well as over on Twitter, I'll be looking for new questions there. Just a couple of days ago, and it's hard to keep track of which days of the week or which uh, for me lately, because there's so much going on. But I, uh, along with uh, my brother and partner, uh, Pastor Edie Mondanay, the president of the NAACP of Portland, we hosted uh, a, a, an action session with uh, Governor Kate Brown, with uh, Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler, and with Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty uh, to hear from them about what they're going to do in the next 30, 60, and 90 days to make life better for Black Oregonians. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, a similar, some similar questions, but I'm going to start off with a question that I didn't ask them, and I really wish I had. Uh, let's talk about what we've seen in uh, the streets of Portland last night and on previous nights. And that is uh, the Portland Police Bureau using tear gas, uh, uh, a chemical weapon that is you know, banned in war um, on the streets of our city. Um, I wanna say as a preamble, uh, some of my staff live downtown in the area where some of the protests have been taking place and where police have used tear gas. And although uh, the couple who have spoken up to me about it have not participated in the protest, they're getting tear gas in their apartments. Uh, there's because it, it floats up as it disperses, right? So it's not just the people who are on the street who are feeling the effects of it. Um, and yesterday on OPB, Think Out Loud with Dave Miller, uh, health professionals talked about the dangers of using tear gas during a pandemic that attacks the lungs. So this uh, question can be approached from a variety of angles, but I'd really like to hear um, first from you, Congressman uh, Blumenauer, and then from you, Senator Frederick, uh, your thoughts on um, the city of Portland using tear gas against uh, protesters. Well, you're correct uh, in terms of uh, its indiscriminate use. There are health consequences, both for the people uh, upon whom it is inflicted and people around them uh, in the broader neighborhood. Um, it's, uh, but it is a symbol, I think, of how we have turned to uh, attempting to force behaviors. We, it's part of the militarization. Uh, tear gas is actually a weapon of war. Uh, and it's a manifestation of that, uh, that mindset about how to deal uh, with disturbance. Uh, I would personally favor banning it in our city. I would favor having federal standards that would limit or prohibit it. Um, this is, if we spent a fraction of the money and time and energy in trying to help de-escalate situations, work to solve problems, uh, and not use blunt instruments. And tear gas is a very blunt instrument. We're also seeing uh, evidence around the country where people use non-lethal mechanisms, uh, rubber bullets. Um, you know, these are these are things that can dis that can have a, a very serious consequence for people. People are injured, blinded. 
I, I sorry to interrupt you. It's hard in, in this format, but I, I was reading yesterday that uh, three percent of people who have been are hit by rubber bullets um, actually uh, actually die uh, because of uh, where where they're hit, how they work. I mean, these are not just wounding weapons. It's it's far more severe than that. And that was news to me. I knew they were awful, but uh, yeah. you know, they're not non-lethal uh, uh, methods. And I was just shocked by that. Well, I, I started to interrupt you. I just wanted to, to, to say that. And I, I, if you wanted to say more, Congressman, please feel free. But Senator no, Fred, no. I, I think it's important, Nakenge, that was an important addition to make. Uh, feel free to cut me off. I want to make sure the Senator has uh, plenty of time and that we get a chance to uh, be able to touch on a variety of subjects. So I'll I'll try and rein myself in. As I said, we'll put out a pretty extensive document later this week informed by our conversation. Senator, will you talk a little bit about the use of tear gas in, in our city? <laughs> yes, I've got to tell you that, that, that tear gas triggers in a whole series of things. My first tear gas was when I was eight years old. Um, so uh, I, rem I remember this, uh, just the, I remember this well, this was Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, and so I remember that then there was a civil rights demonstration. I wasn't in the demonstration. I was in the car when my, when, when, when the students who were in the demonstration were piled into the car filled with tear gas. So um, this is not, this is not an academic exercise for me. I remember it well. It hurts, uh, especially when you're a kid, it hurts. Uh, but uh, I, I, so I remember that there is no, there's no excuse. There's no absolutely no excuse, no reason to be using tear gas in, 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 this, in this situation. Um, the, this is uh, an attempt, the, the basic attempt is once again, an intimidation approach. That's what we're trying to see. That's, what, that's, what, that's the whole goal. It is a militaristic approach uh, because you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to deal with uh, a crowd of people and you may have one or two folks who have actually been the ones who have been involved in something, and they, <clears throat> again, in my experience, I I would go and attend the uh, the route the previous rallies, and I would see certain folks come in and uh, be agents provocateurs set up so that other folks would be damaged, would be uh, attacked as a group, even though they may they may throw something, and then suddenly the police will say, well, everyone threw something, or some, we've got to get these people out of here, so they will do uh, a tear gas thing. No, no excuse. It should not be used. It should not be there. Should not be part of this situation. We have to be talking with folks about that. And the and again, it's it's changing the attitude in terms of what police policing, what what peace what peace is, issues are about, what um, uh, the the kind of issues that we are trying to work on are public safety. That is not public safety. Thank you, Senator. Uh, it's heartening for me to hear the two of you be unequivocal about it, uh, because I, as I talked, as I hear from certain other leaders and certainly leaders in the Portland Police Bureau, um, they don't seem nearly uh, as, as confident in why tear gas is important for their roles as you seem certain that it should not be used. So I thank you for being unequivocal about it. I wanna ask you another question um, uh, related to what we're seeing on the streets of Portland. Uh, and just a few days ago, um, the state, uh, the governor, at the request of the mayor and the U.S. attorney, mobilized the National Guard um, in support of Portland police. Uh, I, I will say that for me, um, it was a, a gutting decision. Uh, I was um, very concerned uh, and called to, to, to ask the mayor to take it back <laughs> um, and called the U.S. attorney to ask him to take it back and called the governor to say, please do not do this. And um, I, I want to get your feedback uh, on this, but I'll tell you why it was so concerning for me. Um, I know the superintendent of state troopers and uh, think that he's a good guy. So it's not about my level of understanding of why they were saying they needed National Guard in our streets. And for viewers who aren't um, familiar, the governor and the mayor and others were saying, well, there simply wasn't enough uh, police people power. And after a few days of protests in Portland uh, and, and, and hours and hours of overtime, police needed a break. And sleepy police are more dangerous police. That's an absolute fact. We know the research on that, right? It stands to reason. So they wanted to bring in extra hands and the only hands they had left were National Guard. What I expressed was, that is dangerous. You will be challenging Portlanders to come to the streets if they see National Guard on our streets because even I um, would, would be likely to join them. It's, it's outrageous to me. What I think they don't understand and I wonder if you would agree 
is that seeing the National Guard in any capacity in, a, in the city of Roses, it sends a message, not only that, not just that they would mobilize the military, but that, that they would do it with so little provocation. It only took three nights of protest. There were fewer than 50 arrests at that time. And they thought bringing out the military was the solution. So the second thing I think they don't understand is that now we know how willing the mayor and the governor are to mobilize the National Guard in the cities in Oregon. And that is what's so scary and why people reacted so strongly to it. I wonder, uh, Senator, I'll start with you and then I'll go to you, Congressman. I'll try to go back and forth that way. Um, if you would react um, and to share with us your feelings, your thoughts about uh, mobilizing the National Guard uh, in our city. Well, let me say, first of all, I was at the news conference when the governor announced that she was going to be dealing with the National Guard. The what she said to me and what she said to at the news conference and others was that the idea was that the National Guard would not be seen. In fact, they would be behind the scenes driving, driving trucks, working, um, working in, in, in inside the system to, to uh, when, when if, if people were arrested to follow to help them um, deal with those arrests but they were not supposed to be seen and they were not supposed to be on the street and they were not supposed to be armed. Um, we saw that that wasn't the case, but, but that's, that was the promise that was given at the time. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, again, my history, my, my, my own personal history is that I remember Washington DC in 1965. I remember Detroit, I remember Watts, I remember Atlanta, I remember um, all of these places that uh, that that exploded, and the National Guard, Newark, the National Guard was called in, and it did not de-escalate de the situation at all. In fact, it it ramped up things. That is a that was the concern that I mentioned at the time. I am still very upset about the idea that we have National Guard troops there, uh, 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 visible, and uh, and and that was not the idea. It was supposed to be just. 50 National Guard troops who were supposed to come in and work behind the scenes in quote support roles. Um, that was not what what took place, and this is the this is a significant concern. So again, there's a. Didn't we couldn't we know that from the beginning though, Senator? Well, no. I I was I I, I took I I I know that I know how upset um, uh, a number of folks were. Uh, Joanne Hardesty and I were both at that news conference. We both. We both heard heard things and believed that we were hearing uh, that something straight there for a change, and uh, we were not. Quite frankly, uh, this was this was something that we we made it clear. Both of us said the first time, as you as you responded, first time we heard National Guard, we both went, uh, "No, we don't want to do that." Uh, we were we were assured that there were other things that were going to be done. This is uh, this is the kind of stuff that we have to um, we we have to really pay attention to. And, uh, and now, you know, it's, it's a show me sort of thing. Don't just tell me what you're planning on doing. Uh, show me what you're doing. Uh, if, you're going, if you're going to bring in, if you're saying you're going to bring in the National Guard, don't tell me that you're not going to, uh, that you're not, that, that they're going to, not going to have weapons, that they're not going to be, that they're going to be very visible. They, they, were, they were visible. That was not the idea. I think so, that's what's so upsetting for, for many of us is that, yeah. you know, we knew that that's what would happen even though, even as our leaders were saying that it wouldn't. Uh, well, Congress, I, you know, sorry, it, it, you're, you're right. I understand why you say that. Uh, I was, uh, I thought that, I, I, I thought it, we had made it as clear as we possibly could what we expected. And, um, and though we made it as clear as we possibly could, it's clearly, it did not come through. So I, I, I will say verse, I think I am, uh, I guess complicit in this because I thought that we were that we had a uh, a basic uh, understanding, a basic agreement about what was going to take place, and that was not the case. Uh, what would this, you do next time? Well, next time, <laughs> next time I basically will say, um, sorry, that does no, no. We 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 know your line. We know that this is not going to happen. That you're that you're not going to follow through on this. Uh, so. No, um, if you if you want to bring want to do some things like this, you're going to have to find another way because what you're saying is you are you are you've decided that the only way to deal with this situation is to deal with it in a militaristic fashion, uh, and that's not okay. Thank you, Senator Congressman. I'd love to uh, hear your input. I know you've been hearing from the White House about their desire to have military in our streets uh, and in your favorite city. Um, I wonder what you think about uh, that having happened. 
Well, we all have memories of what happened when uh, young uh, National Guard troopers in stressful situations. Um, we think Jackson State, Kent State, where students were gunned down um, by uh, National Guard members who shouldn't have been there in the first place. I have great respect for the National Guard and the work that they do. Uh, what's happened here in Oregon on so many different levels, uh, fighting forest fires, working on community projects. Um, and they have been stressed uh, unbelievably by being forced to go to Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, in some cases, repeated deployments. Um, and we put them in, in, in harm's way in unspeakable ways and they, and they came back uh, in many cases with wounds visible or invisible. Uh, I respect the guard. I want to use the guard appropriately. Um, I don't want it to be a plaything for Donald Trump. And I think that there is a danger, uh, a Lou referenced, in terms of uh, acting as a source of provocation. We don't need to add fuel to the flames. Now, it may well be that in Oregon, we need more relief for people on the front lines. I don't doubt that but maybe we could be a little more creative about how we give them that relief uh, from the Oregon Department of Transportation uh, that has people all over the state um, uh, who are used to working in emergencies. They can deal with some of the logistics. I mean, we, we have 70,000 state employees. Uh, I would think that there might be others who could help us provide the relief. But you know, it's interesting, uh, the last uh, few nights watching the young people mobilize uh, uh, for the march downtown. And you look, that, that, that field completely, uh, I mean, well, hopefully there, were, there was some social distancing observed, a little closer than I would like, um, but how orderly and thoughtful it was. People who were there, uh, directing traffic, handing out water, um, being, uh, being so constructive. And, it, and it, it, it took place without any visible signs of uh, outside forces. The, the young people, the community leaders uh, organized uh, a very powerful demonstration. Uh, and each night it appears that, they, that they're more effective, that they, that, they, that they learn and they're building. Um, I think it's really uh, the wrong signal to send where the first response appears to be one that is militaristic. Uh, that is not without cost, both to the men and women who are involved being mobilized, the signals it sends to the community and putting people uh, potentially in harm's way. Uh, to me, that's the, that's the last group that I would seek to mobilize. I think we should go in other areas and be sensitive to the signals that are being sent. Um, and what Donald Trump is doing is unconscionable. Um, I mean, this is the, he's, he's pouring gasoline on the flames, trying to, uh, and again, putting people in places where they don't belong, uh, having all sorts of federal agencies anonymously. You don't even know who it is that is hurting. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting off target, but uh, uh, I, I, that was not my first response, McKinney. Uh, thank you both for that. Um, I can imagine what might have happened had our leaders, instead of calling for the National Guard, come forward and say, hey, uh, I've had calls uh, to bring the National Guard to our streets. We think that we need some more people power out here. So I'm going to ask the people who are protesting to make it so I don't, I, I don't need to call them up. Can we have a, a, a night of, 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 of greater peace? Can we do something else? What if our leaders had redirected that attention um, the, or that focus, that energy that they uh, felt was so concerning? Well, um, if, if I can jump in just a second. Yeah. I think that in fact, the protesters, the, the folks who were out there protesting did just that. That's um, right. The next few days, that's exactly what they did. They said, we do not wanna be part of this. The pro one of the problems we have is we, we know that we have agents provocateurs out there doing things just to set up things, just to set up a, a, a confrontation. And, 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 and the, the, pro, the, the, the demonstrators who were 
who filled uh, Burnside's uh, uh, bridge, who filled the Morrison Bridge, who filled the Hawthorne Bridge, who filled the, the waterfront, um, all of those folks came in and Pioneer Courthouse Square, they stopped a number of things that were happening along the way. I, I know that, I've seen those, those pictures, but they, also, but they also had people behind the scenes and in other sections who were determined to disrupt and they could not get to some of those folks. That's part of what we have. And, and people, were, people have responded that way. I am really, really proud of the demonstrators who, who you've spoken to, because you've had a couple of speeches in those, those places. They did exactly that. They said, we're not gonna have this take place. We're gonna, we're going to stop this thing from taking place. And they, they worked on, at it very well. We, we still have an issue of folks who are determined to create a, uh, a situation so that, that somebody can somehow justify, try to justify coming in with a militaristic fa in a militaristic fashion. It drives me nuts because I, I've seen it. I saw it take place downtown and on previous demonstrations. And I saw, the, I saw the, the strategy that was used to do that. So we need to figure out how we can, how we can handle that as well. I think, and um, Congressman and Senator, I'm glad you both mentioned the peaceful protests. Uh, no, let me say that differently. Uh, the nonviolent uh, protests that have been happening, been organized by our youth, because there can be no peace until there is justice. Uh, and 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 the young people who've been gathering at Revolution Hall uh, and marching uh, to the Tom McCall Waterfront Park, they've been very clear about that. That they are they are not peaceful. They do not need to be petted uh, in that fashion by, uh, by law enforcement, by the mayor, by anyone. In fact, they are nonviolent resistors. Uh, and, and it's an important differ, uh, differentiation. And I, and I uh, was honored to speak to them on Thursday night, uh, and stay, but I stayed all night. It's not about me talking to them. It's about me being able to listen and being there to support them because uh, they're doing an incredible job. You know, I get, for a living, I work in civil rights and these folks have just picked up the baton and gotten out there on their own and they're making a real difference. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible what they've been able to organize. Um, so here, here, Congressman, when you say that perhaps there are other ways for our state and the cities to respond uh, to people who just, who want to be heard and who want to make a difference. Um, I'm going to ask a question that uh, came in early, I think, to the Congressman's office. Um, and folks want to know, what are you doing, Congressman, to get military equipment out of the hands of local police? Uh, well, there are a, a series of things that we're looking at in terms of eliminating specific programs that deal with providing this surplus military equipment. Lou mentioned it. I mean, the the, the military hardware that is scattered across America, and in some cases in, in small rural outposts uh, that, that actually could uh, be uh, inflicted in a war zone. Uh, it is, it's quite disconcerting on three levels. Number one, if you are going to put military equipment on that scale, in the hands of people who are in a paramilitary organization, it's much more likely that it is going to be used. And in virtually every instance, that's inappropriate. It can only lead to bad results. Second, it is such a signal to the community, particularly to young people, um, about what the approach is going to be to a public safety issue. It's not a problem solving mode. It is brute force. It's a show of force. It's, it is trying to intimidate. Um, and that, anybody who's had teenagers know that, that and that's not necessarily the best approach uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Is there and legislation finally, that we can support? Is there something that we can do to support you uh, yeah, to, we'll, at the federal level to make sure we can get these things off our streets? Yeah, yeah we, we will. Uh, that'll be part of the report I'll put out. It'll give specific bill numbers that we're moving to try and uh, to uh, eliminate the authorization for the disbursement of this surplus I, uh, um, uh, equipment. But I guess the last point is that we should not be spending that much money uh, in excess of our actual military needs. The fact that we've got these huge surpluses, they don't quite know what to do with it. And it costs money to distribute it and to follow all the rules and regulations. 
we shouldn't be spending that money in the first place. We ought to be investing in things apropos to the, the reference to the peace officers. We ought to be investing in mechanisms that help them de-escalate, help them problem solve, help them deal with people in crisis, which we have every day in our community, um, homeless, mentally ill, addicted, uh, people uh, in domestic uh, circumstances that are, the more that we can focus on resources to help them solve problems, rather than a show of force, bells and whistles and gadgets that can only be misused in these circumstances. We don't need bazookas and tanks in American cities. That's right. Uh, thank you for that, Congressman. Senator, I'm gonna ask you another question that came in early. Um, and I'm, uh, please don't feel like I, I don't want you to react to all of these, but with our limited time, I want to get to as many questions uh, as possible. Sure. Um, what are the concrete steps uh, that local and federal officials, Congressman, uh, can take to redirect spending on police? So just to, you were just remarking uh, moments ago that we spend too much uh, on, on these tools of war that are deployed in our cities. Um, so uh, Representative Lou, uh, Senator <laughs> Lou Frederick, uh, <laughs> what concrete steps can, um, can you take, can our state legislature take, can our state government take uh, to redirect spending from police, uh, from prisons to social support uh, that we know keeps people out of jail, uh, like food, housing, healthcare, that make a real impact. This is uh, this is one of the things that I think we're we actually have an opportunity now in a way that we did not before. The whole uh, virus and COVID crisis showed us what the disparities were like and where they were, and we have we have significant um, um, funding issues that we're going to be struggling with for some time, and so we have to decide what the priorities are going to be. Um, public safety, uh, the police, when you talk with them, they don't spend all of their time shooting at people. They don't spend all of their time running around trying to necessarily to intimidate folks. They spend much of their time dealing with conflict resolution issues, mental health, alcohol and drug abuse issues, uh, domestic violence, those, those kinds. That's what they spend their time on. So and not what they're trained for, right? Not, and not what they're trained for. That, that's a part of it too. So we, uh, I, in terms of what we can do, I hope that what, 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 I, what I plan and some of the bills that I'm looking at are trying to say, these are the priorities you should be spending money on. This is what we're gonna send you money from the state to do. This is what we, we think should, this is, these are, these are the, the support things that we think you should be dealing with, not buying uh, you know, a, a bazooka or, 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 or something like that. We, you need to be trained on how you handle um, the, the people in your community. And you have to be in the community too. You, there's, gotta be a, there's got to be a training and a recruitment strategy that deals with the idea that you are living in a community with other people, that the folks that you approach, that you're dealing with are not the enemy. Uh, they are in fact your neighbors. That's a very different mindset altogether. So the recruitment's gotta be part of that as well. And, and the training has gotta be part of that as well. It's not just de a de-escalation class that takes place for a couple of days or even a week or two. You've gotta really have a sense of that the, the, the goal here is public safety, not uh, trying to get as many people as possible in jail or, or, or intimidation. So what about I have a series thinking? of things that we're gonna be looking at re re related to that. I, I think that we can talk about training, we can talk about um, representation and, and community oversight. All of those things are gonna be part of it. And just tracking police officers. If we have police officers who are doing things on a regular basis, who are violating discipline issues, we need to track and find out who they are and make sure that they're not passed along from one department to the next. That's I know Senator Merkley has a, has a bill uh, at the federal level related to tracking police who are able to go from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as bad actors. Uh, right. But I also wanna ask you about replacing police officers. Uh, someone mentioned to me yeah. yesterday on Twitter, uh, you know, what if there was someone you could call who didn't show up with a gun? Right. There's so many things that police officers do now that, and that's why they say they need more people power. There are too few officers. But what if instead we had counselors? What if instead we had therapists? What if instead Oregon had actual drug and alcohol treatment programs? Couldn't we focus our energies and our funds there instead of to, to policing and retraining them? That is exactly what we need to be doing. And we need to be encouraging more folks to go into those particular fields because, and, and changing 
the approach that we've had to what police officers are, well, are, again, what peace officers are actually involved with. What we, what we want in terms of public safety is making sure that we have enough counselors, that we have enough folks who can actually deal with those basic issues that, put, that, the, that the presently police officers do without the training to do that. There are some police officers who are trained to do that, and they are few and far between. Very few and far between. Uh, Congressman, okay. you we are. Are, I'd like you to weigh in on this, please, because it's a Oregon and ranks highest, uh, one of the highest states in the in the union um, for uh, mental health issues with alcohol and substance abuse, and we're one of the lowest for treatment issues. And those are the people who, again and again, are getting locked up. Is there something you can do on a federal level to try to make a difference here in our community? Yeah. Absolutely. One of the things that I feel very strongly about is that there ought to be some, when we're dealing with trying to recover from the COVID-19 disaster, where we're trying to get the economy back on short, we're going to try and help state and local government, which are in economic free fall. And I, I just uh, feel very bad for what Senator Frederick's going to be facing uh, with the next session of the legislature. Well, the federal government ought to step up and provide public safety grant programs for non-uniform personnel. The police bureau has done work on housing uh, and counseling. They, they want more of this. Uh, we ought to, but it's a very inefficient way to deliver it through the police bureau. We ought to be able to have people who are trained to de-escalate a situation. The, Would that funding go to go to health departments, Congressman, instead of going to, to police departments? Yeah, I think there ought to be special uh, designated programs in the community that deals with people in crisis. It, part of it's mental health. Part of it is drug and alcohol. Uh, part of it is you know just being able to de-escalate a crisis. And those are different skill set. You don't need a gun or a badge. Uh, in fact, in some instances, it might help. Now, there are some uh, police officers who are who work at this and who are good at it. But the fact is that we shouldn't have our mental health system be default in our jails and our courts. Uh, that's, that's not the humane way to be able to cope with it. And these resources ought to be dedicated to this purpose. Uh, we've seen uh, Commissioner Hardesty, Commissioner Daly wanting an alternative program at the city, but with the budget collapsing, uh, sadly, that's going to be hard. We ought to have the federal government make up that gap. Everybody would be better off. Thank you for saying that, Congressman. I think it's very important. And for folks who are watching and thinking, well, there are certain resources in the county and we have a, a, a hotline to call if someone um, is in distress. It just so happens that yesterday, uh, my team at the Urban League witnessed someone um, who, who was clearly in distress, walking down the street um, naked uh, near our office and weaving in and out of traffic. And they tried to approach and engage to see if um, they could help uh, just briefly, and, and that didn't work. They ran inside and called the Multnomah County um, Emergency Assistance Line, and it took forever to get an answer. And when they got an answer, uh, they were told eventually, well, you should just call the police. Uh, you know, um, we have got to do better uh, for our county. We've got to do better for our city uh, and, and really invest in systems that we say that we believe in. Uh, I'm going to change gears a little bit and ask you a question that came in previously about police unions. Um, it, the question says, uh, police unions are an important obstacle to necessary reforms. Uh, and what can be done about the police unions that constantly protect officers who hold the attitude that officers are untouchable for punishment? What sort of federal legislation, what sort of state legislation could help cities negotiate needed changes in police contracts? And before you answer, I want to mention to all my friends in labor, uh, because I am, grew up in a union household and an absolutely pro-labor. Uh, police unions are different than other labor unions. They are regressive and they stand in the way of progress and justice in our communities, unlike other workers unions do. They're not like nurses. They're not like teachers. They're not like school bus drivers. It's a very different dynamic they have set up. And we have got to stop letting them hide behind the moniker of being pro-worker and pro-labor because they are not. There is my commercial congressman. If you would please address the issue of how uh, the federal government uh, uh, may be able to help make a difference in well, the area. Of part, of, part of what the federal government can do is to establish standards on the use of force. And there's no uh, labor contract or local ordinance that will supersede that. That would be something that would be uniform across the country. Uh, and I think it is 
long overdue. I think we can prohibit the use of no knock warrants. You know, the, the situation that we, you know, just shy of her 27th birthday, get shot eight times in her bedroom uh, for somebody who didn't even, a suspect that didn't even live there. For an illegal warrant, we now know. Uh, yeah. Folks, the congressman is referring to uh, Brianna Taylor, who was murdered in her home in, uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, on a, a warrant that should not have existed. Um, she was shot and killed by police uh, in, uh, in the middle of the night. And that's, that is a, a, a technique that uh, I think has no place in, in modern law enforcement. Uh, we've also, one of the challenges we have with law enforcement that there, there has been developed um, a theory of qualified immunity that restricts uh, the police from being held legally accountable when they break the law. And this isn't in the constitution. Uh, it isn't any law. It's, it was sort of a judicial theory that has taken on a life of its own, uh, used by some police unions, used uh, in circumstances that I think just uh, are inappropriate. And we're having, uh, uh, we're having a bipartisan uh, initiative to repeal this, this concept, to make it clear that it's not the law, it's explicit that we explicitly repeal what this judge-made standard is, which is going to make it easier to have appropriate accountability, not an artificial shield against people being held accountable for their actions. Well, Congressman, will that will you be discussing that in in the document you're releasing? Yes. So yes, know yes. To find out yeah. more. Yeah, and it's uh, it's being uh, actually uh, Justin Amash, uh, the uh, independent member of Congress, uh, uh, who's uh, who's very good working on civil liberties issues, and Justin is one of the people who sees that it's a great optic to have the only independent in Congress uh, work with. Uh, black Congress people uh, to try and get this uh, pernicious doctrine laid to rest. Thank you, if Congressman. May, um, we, this is one of the issues. This is my arbitration bill, the one that I, that I talked about. We passed unanimously through the Senate in 2019, unanimously through the Senate in 2020. Uh, it was held up in the House Committee in, in Oregon in 2019. And in 2020, uh, because of the walkout um, it was not brought to the floor of the House, but we we've, we've, we are looking, it's part of the issue in terms of creating a union contract that actually uh, allows for discipline uh, that is not uh, behind the scenes or uh, allows arbitrators to simply uh, dismiss any, um, uh, any, any, any responsibility, any discipline that takes place uh, and, and change it and, and send people back to the force when everyone knows that they shouldn't be there. Um, this, this is an issue I think that we, we really need to deal with. It's the fact that we, a lot of people expected that the police would police themselves. They do not. They do not. And, uh, and, and we saw this yesterday with the whole Buffalo situation where the, the folks, uh, the fellow who was knocked to the ground, his head cracked uh, at 75 years old and he, uh, and the and when they when they decided to discipline one of the people in that SWAT team, uh, and, and the the rest of the SWAT team decided that they were going to resign from the SWAT team because uh, they were showing solidarity with their with their fellow person uh, with their fellow uh, SWAT team member. Uh, what it shows to me is that none of those folks should be on the street. Okay. They really they they really don't feel as though that's the case. And here's the other aspect and something that um, that uh, the congressman brought up. The fact is, when you have a situation like has taken place in Oregon and Portland, where you where there is a, a financial uh, payment out to a family or to a particular individual because of bad action by a police officer, that's paid out by the insurance company for the city. It's not it. There's the no one feels that at all. No one in the city. No one in the police force. No okay. one in the union feels that at all. It's the paid public out. is paying again, right? We pay, for paying, the officer, exactly. we pay for the equipment and then we pay the damages after they have broken the law and they get to continue on merrily earning their pay and their pension. And often all they have to say is, uh, I felt my life was in danger 
And so they, they get off on, on that. That's the kind of thing that we need to be able to address. And we haven't addressed it. It is, it's also the fact that in many cases, the culture of the force uh, encourages an alpha dog kind of situation. Anybody who is more violent or has more discipline concerns is somehow looked up to by the rest of the, the force. That kind of approach has to change. It, it, Senator, that, that is why we're not merely talking about a, uh, you know, a bad apple here, a bad apple there. The example right. you gave yesterday of that video where the uh, police knocked down a 75 year old man, he was bleeding from the head. One officer gestured as if though he was going to check on him, going to you know, try to pick him up. Another officer pulled him back and then they all walked by this man who was bleeding on the sidewalk. That's further proof that one bad apple, this, that, it's simply not true. And okay. we can't trim around the edges. We've really got to di uh, dive deep. A little reform here, a little reform there is not going to make a change because one good guy can't stand up into the face of that. Well, there are also the rest of that phrase, that phrase is one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. Okay. <laughs> that spoils the whole barrel. That's exactly what we're seeing. We, we, we know that that's the case and we have not seen, we have not taken that on. It is time to take that on. There are, other, there are other tools uh, that we have that uh, that supersede uh, union contracts and local policies. One of the most powerful in the past has been civil rights violations, where we have the U.S. Department of Justice, maybe not with Barr and Trump, but it's still uh, something that uh, that is available. One of the problems that we've got uh, dealing with uh, uh, prosecution for uh, holding a, a law enforcement uh, accountable for deprivation of civil rights and civil liberties is the standard that it must be willful. If we simply change that standard from willful denial to reckless, it will be easier to be able to hold people accountable under basic civil rights law, which applies in every community across the country. Uh, it sounds like a little change, but it's very significant. And it's one more tool in our toolkit. Thank you, that's a great example. Uh, can we talk a little bit about um, the connections we see between organized white supremacy and uh, police? both in Oregon and, and across the country, if, if you'd like. But um, we've seen uh, a number of examples. Um, and it's one of the questions that came in here uh, about white supremacists working within our police bureaus. And uh, if not working, and even if not working within, certainly being sympathetic. Um, often people have complained about the way that Proud Boys and other um, would-be Nazis uh, uh, act on, the, on our streets and how they're treated by law enforcement. Um, it's very different than the way that their posture towards Antifa and even toward the young protesters that we see out there. Uh, will you talk a little bit about that? Because it's something that comes up pretty frequently uh, and then it sort of dies off. No one uh, in our elected offices uh, talks about it much, but I'd like to address it here uh, for this questioner. Well, I, I talk about it a lot. So, I mean, it's one of those things that- I'm uh, sorry, Senator. Uh, not many of our elected officials- Not many of our elected <laughs> officials. I appreciate that. No, that that is a that is a significant concern because when I when I attended the uh, the rally, the previous rallies and and marches, et cetera, downtown, I saw uh, a clear situation where people were being treated differently. Um, you know, the, uh, the 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 proud boys or whatever they call themselves uh, were being treated very much differently than anybody else who was in the crowd by the police, by the by the Portland police. You could see it. It, it was very blatant, and and I would sit off to the side and watch. Uh, as well, watch these those folks actually disguise themselves, walk into uh, the crowd of of, of peace, uh, of peaceful demonstrators, and uh, and 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 do something, try to create an, an issue, and then walk out, re 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 um, put their other clothing on and their hoods on or whatever, uh, and walk into the Proud Boys area and just sit there and laugh and watch what was going, what 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 they had started. So there's, there's clearly a connection there. It, it's, it's not a, we were, we're trying to just work with people. We're trying to figure out and we have to do some things. There's clearly been a connection. 
I've seen the, the um, I've seen the uh, agents provocateurs thing much of my life, uh, going back into the early '60s with uh, with folks coming in. One guy wanting us to to take on uh, some C some C four and blow up things in a peace group, and we had to kick him out of the peace group. Uh, years later, I saw him on the street of streets of Atlanta in a police uniform. Um, you know, th these are the kinds of things that have taken that I've seen take place. Um, I it is it doesn't surprise me at all, not at all that that's what's going on. And in fact, I think it's a a strategy across the country uh, where people are are being set up so that they can, uh, they can do certain things and, and get away with it because they're, they, they seem to have the approval of the police uh, department, the police, uh, the, some of the police officers uh, in the system. So yes, that's there, that's, that's clearly there. This is not some um, uh, conspiracy theory. We've seen it, I've seen it with my own eyes. So it's a, it's a real concern and we have not addressed it at all. I think it's a it's a very much I think a question of being able to have the appropriate uh, priorities set. We sadly, what you're talking about, Nakenge, goes back generations. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan had sort of an incestuous relationship uh, with the white power structure and county sheriffs throughout the South. Um, we have seen, uh, let's just say, not uh, the most vigorous prosecution. When, when uh, in, in terms of lynchings, when we uh, look at uh, the, the evolution of white supremacists as a national security threat in the Obama administration. And uh, sadly, there were Republicans in Congress who just put, uh, put a halt to uh, being able even to co collect the data to demonstrate that. So this is an area that has been a persistent problem uh, it's one where uh, we uh, have not uh, attacked it head on. Uh, it continues to fester. Uh, and I'm hopeful that this is part of what we do in terms of changing some of these standards, for instance, the data collection, which sounds you know, kind of nitpicky, but being able to document what's going on and be able to track this makes a huge difference. Uh, but this is a, a pattern that has persisted uh, for far too long and I hope that this will be one of the changes that comes out of the actions of the last couple of weeks. We're reaching the end of our time soon. It's gone by very quickly. Uh, but before we close, I'd like to uh, hear from either of you about what, what else you might like to talk about today. Uh, and I'll say that you know, I'm tired. Um, Congressman, I think, I think I know how, uh, how weariness sets in now because I feel it in my bones. Um, it's why I'm up all day. It's why I'm trying to go out at night to, to, to protest, uh, because we have a moment here where everyone in the country seems to be focused on the same thing, and that's building justice. We may have different ideas about how to get there, uh, but at least now we're having the same conversation. Uh, but I'm tired, and I'm worried that if we don't do it now, we never will. And frankly, why should I have to wait? I'm an American. This is my country. This is my state. Uh, the, it's, it's my city. Uh, I should have the full rights uh, vested in me just as you do, uh, and I shouldn't have to wait any longer. Um, that's, that's sort of the way that I'm feeling now, and I'm hoping that, that something will change, that we will make the change. Um, what else might you like to say before we wrap up? Lou, you? Well, I, uh, in King Gay, I, I understand your exhaustion. I'm exhausted as well. Um, but uh, I also have the belief that I'm, I'm seeing I, I, I cannot begin to tell you how much I smiled when I saw the Burnside Bridge the other night, uh, when I saw the folks uh, in Waterfront Park. Um, it is not just a group of um, African-American folks go going out there saying enough, enough, enough. We have a much larger uh, awareness now of people saying that this has got to change. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that, but I am also determined that we are not gonna let this uh, moment slip by. We have, to take it, we have to take action. We have to take action now. We have to keep, that, keep, uh, it, keep the, um, the pressure on mm -hmm. to make sure that we change not just individual laws, but actually begin to change a culture that has uh, rewarded violence, that has rewarded um, uh, intimidation, 
that has rewarded a, 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 a belief that people, some people are less than human. Um, we can simply not do that anymore. I've had my, I've had my fill of it. I've had my, had my fill of it a long time ago, but I think we're starting to see some changes. I hope we'll get that done. So, Representative? You, you two are examples of why I wake up every morning energized. It is, it is wearing. We've never seen anything like this with the economic collapse, with the healthcare, with the tremendous angst and outrage about what's happened to black Americans in the law enforcement. All of this kind of converging, uh, I think this is probably the most perilous time in our nation's history with the possible exception of the civil war. And I'm not sure about that. But what we're seeing is phenomenal. Uh, the, the energy of young people and new voices. But we see uh, the continued advocacy of veterans like you two uh, making progress and, and making what uh, my friend John Lewis would call good trouble and holding accountable. Um, uh, I, I am encouraged in a way that uh, some may think I'm de delusional, but I think we're seeing people focusing. I see more people being engaged. I see more political action. I see action in the streets. I see people putting a spotlight on simple common sense things that need to be done. Um, and I think we've reached a moment in our history uh, over the next uh, six months uh, and, and beyond that. I think the next 30 months will be transformational in this country if we all do our job. It's already making a difference. There are white people who pretty clearly committed murder who are being charged with murder. We wouldn't have seen that. We have the awareness taking place. And then we have this amazing activity in the community. So I'm, uh, I am encouraged, I'm energized and look forward to working with you in partnership with deep appreciation for what you two have done. It uh, really makes a difference. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, can we uh, do this again? Can we check in after the special session and after you've had a time to go back to DC, Congressman, to work on some of the legislation we, you mentioned? I'm I would be honored. Available. Absolutely. Thank you both so much. And to uh, the hundreds of people who are watching um, on, on YouTube, we really appreciate you for being here. Folks who are following along and, and, and tweeting and sending in questions, we thank you also for being here. We hope that we have done justice to your time. Uh, please continue to be out to talk, to engage, to let your elected officials know what you wanna see uh, toward the path to building justice because the time is now. We don't have to wait anymore. The time Great. is now. Thank you Thank so you. much. Bye-bye. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye, Congressman. Bye-bye, Senator Frederick. Bye-bye, take you. care.